Spiritual journey is a very interesting one. It's a very personal one. It's a very subjective one. By no means um, I mean to preach just because I'm on this side of, of the platform. But I'm merely an instrument to share my experiences, my thoughts, my perspectives, so you can compare them with your own and come to your own conclusions and understanding. To me, as I learned with Swami, as we endearingly call him, Baba, as most of the people know him, Swami encouraged that. It, it was not because he preached to us that we learned spirituality. It was not because he performed some miracles that we were inspired in the spiritual path, but because he encouraged us to discover our own inner self through dialogue, through teaching, and, and most importantly, by being um, a fantastic role model for us. And so everything that I share today here is, is entirely um, dedicated to his lotus feet because without him, um, like I've often said, I, I, would, I would have been um, somebody in the Pune Film Institute because that was my goal before joining Baba's Institute from Bombay. So inspired by Vinod Khanna and Amitabh Bachchan that <laughs> I wanted to be, um, and Keshto Mukherjee, who was my, <laughs> he would give me splits with his acting. So for some reason, I wanted to be a comedian. But somewhere, I often think of that. What if Baba was not in our life? You know, where we, where we would have been? I don't know. For, at least for myself, I would have been lost. But a guru comes at the right time, and thanks to my parents' prayers, my grandparents, they were all so extremely devoted to Lord Shiva and Muruga, being, we being South Indians. Um, I think that grace flowed into my life and that continuation happened. I got a chance to discover my God, my path to spirituality because I realized one thing that that path was not my path. And the more they tried to put me into that path, the more I rebelled against it. Um, I wanted to know more. I wanted to know it my way. I wanted a language that made sense to me. And in that generation, they could not give that to me. And therefore, the Spuna Institute became a viable option, a very tempting option for me. Um, and the reason I say this always is it is so important that we discover our own connection to God. My story cannot be your story. Um, your story cannot be my story. Your life and your experiences with Him is so unique. The trials and tribulations that you undergo with God with you um, and the joys that you have experienced uh, experiencing His presence, all of that is so unique that I can only learn to get inspired from that, listening to that, and, and vice versa. And you get inspiration from what I have to share. And in this learning, that's what we call a satsang, is where we discuss and we learn, we listen and learn from that and, and draw parallels in our own lives and then we draw inspiration from that. But most importantly, with that we go, we have to go into from satsang, we have to go into nitsangatvam. You know, Adi Shankara says this in Bhajagavanda very beautifully. Satsangatve, and Baba used to sing this very often in the early days. Um, satsangatve nitsangatvam. So satsanga, which we do once a week, or whether we go for bhajans as a center or as personal, whatever it is, that's not the end of it. Some of us might, might feel that, okay, I'm going once a week to satsang and that's good. Baba will take care of it. It's like saying, I know A for apple, B for bat, so I know the English language. That's just the beginning, right? You're just beginning to put the letters together. In other words, this is where the kickstart, you know, you kickstart your car. Um, it's like that satsangatve nitsangatvam. That means just like you're in the company, then you go to a, a place of aloneness. Nitsanga, no sangha. That, there I'm alone. So that aloneness is the next step. So what do I do with this inspiration? What do I do with these thoughts? Do I take time to go within and say, what did I learn today? How can I make that connection? And, and feel that direct connection with God. It is so vital because, again, that is only number two, right? Satsangate nitsangatvam nitsangatve nir... Um, Nirmohatvam. So in that aloneness, you will slowly find that all these delusions, moha, nirmohatvam will happen. That is all these um, confusions or all these distractions, all will slowly clear. Our fears, our guilt, our whatever it is. Sometimes we feel ashamed of something's happening in our life. All that will go in that aloneness. It will disappear. We have to let it go. We can't cling to it. 
In the aloneness, we face the glow, ghosts in our closet and let them all go. So nirmohatve, when that happens, nischala tattvam. The chala, the mind which is constantly wavering, achitta which is constantly wavering, as um, Patanjali writes, vikshipta. Sometimes it's steady, sometimes it's wavering. Sometimes it's steady and he says 90% of us are caught here. And so um, that nischala tattvam begins to established, nischala, no chala, that means no wavering of the mind, it kind of becomes steady and therein lies the secret. In that steadiness, jivan muktihi, you are enlightened as when you lie, live. Enlightenment in, in Vedanta, as I have understood it and I, and I uh, vouch by it, enlightenment and liberation is not after death. If we die ignorant, we are definite to be born. We have to be enlightened in this as we live. In other words, we have to know that we were never born, we never die. And with that knowledge, when the body is shed, you are already liberated. By at that point, there is no. It doesn't matter whether the body exists or not, right? That is true sense of liberation. Uh, just because we wish we want to get liberated, Swami, liberate me, liberate me, lead Tata. So we keep praying for that. And so our praying for liberation becomes reality. Liberation really never happens. Why? Because the question comes, who is asking for this liberation? Who is asking for this ultimate salvation? Who is the one who is asking? Is Sundar asking it? But Sundar is just the name of this body. It's a false identity owned here. This, this identity is anyway gone after this birth. It's a very temporary thing. So who is the one asking? The one who's asking is already liberated. He was never born, he's never going to die. So this asking for liberation becomes redundant. When that true sense sets in, Jeevan Mukti happens. But when does that true uh, understanding set in? When we are in the aloneness, when their mind is calm and the, and the reflection of our inner self is seen, we have to know that we are truly liberated, right? It's not an intellectual understanding. We have to truly see ourselves as eternal. That darshana, if you will, happens when the mind is clean and the reflection comes and you say, aha, like in the Lion King, the cub saw the father's and he says, oh my gosh, I just look like my father. And he hears his father's voice speaking through him. There is no difference. So just like Jesus said, I'm the son of man, I'm the son of my father, uh, and my father and I are one. That realization comes when you see in that nishchala tattvam. Then on that spot you understand and the jivan mukti happens. So, satsanga is just the first step where we really share these um, experiences, these thoughts, so that we can open our lives to something that really, really matters um, in this passage. We were sitting um, at Baba's feet one day in Vrindavan, and um, Baba was very excited. So, on the one hand, Baba will come to us as the all knowing. Purusha, there's sometimes he'll be a stern father, sometimes a very loving mother. Did you eat? Why, what's, why are you coughing? And he'll take care of that. Sometimes he, he's just like us, an excited teenager, or maybe even younger. <laughs> so this was one evening where he was excited. Why? Because he was getting his Jaguar car. Mm -hmm. Swami is very innocent. There was never a, he would never hide his emotions or portray, no, no, car, somebody is giving the car, I am detached, I am not, no such drama. He is excited about something, it will be very evident on his face. Swami said, you know what is coming today, Swami, some a new Jaguar car is coming for Swami. He is as excited as all of us. So we are sitting and he is so excited that he is literally sitting on the driveway, we had his chair put <laughs> and we are sitting on him and the car is going to drive down. So he is so excited, he is sitting out there waiting for the car to come. And he was telling, oh, this has got, uh, the petrol is not normal petrol. This is the, the petrol they'll put for the aircraft. It's that kind of white petrol or something. I don't know. Some, if, I'm just going by memory of what I heard at that moment. He was telling all the others, that's a car, you know. And actually, there's, there's a window that opens and you can even stand up and wave. Um, so those days, the moon roof or whatever was rare, I guess. But the fact that Swami was so childish about it. Um, so we were sitting there, though th this is not the main crux of the story, but I'm just, see how beautifully he explains us fundamental truths in, in kind of these kind of situations. He never loses track of the, the what is really important, right? But, but those kind of uh, beautiful teachings, he just slips it in. Like, you, you know, you know we, we don't like taking medicines, but with a sugar pill, you know, the sugar pill makes the medicine goes down. Isn't that what Mary Poppins sing? Uh -huh. A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. <laughs> so that spoonful of sugar, he'll make all of us and then suddenly slip in a beautiful teaching. Um, and I want to share some of those. Because those are the things that, you know, um, we would say, aha. 
so in all that Mahabharata war, Vyasa rites and all of that, and then he slips in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the real medicine. So we are all waiting for the war to happen and suddenly we hear this. So in, it, it's like the advertisement coming at the right time. <laughs> So people can't switch it off because it's too much excitement right in the time of the game, correct? Isn't that where it's most expensive? So they know exactly where to slip in and Swami knew that as well. So what happened was he was, cha he was chatting and then he, he was waiting for the car. Um, and there was a, a, he was looking down, talking to us and suddenly there was an ant, a big black ant was crossing with something uh, like kind of a grass in his mouth, little, and so it, it was crossing and there was a, a, a crack in the driveway, concrete, and he was trying to go in, but that stick was holding it back, he couldn't, he was trying to go back and forth, something was doing. So Swami was distracted between that and the car and he was watching it and after that he said, Chudara, this is like too much baggage, it cannot go. He wants to take the baggage and go. Then he said, what are we going to take when we go? It's, we're going to take nothing. Just let go and go inside. But the, it doesn't want to let go. It doesn't want to take it. It cannot go. And Swami was you know, laughing and, and, and talking about it. But it was such a profound moment there. He, was, he said, either me, life, me, life, lo kodo, it baggage you. You all carry a lot of baggage. Degrees is your baggage, your, your accomplishments and all your pride. You carry all that with you. You're going to take nothing with you. Are you ready to let go? And so that ant actually, as he was speaking, he had to go inside. So it had to let go of that little twig, whatever it was carrying, some sweet thing, I guess. And it went inside. See, even the ant realizes it has to let go. Me buddhi lo etla gudu, inta gudu kinchit, you know, something like that. Like, not a tiny brain, you have like an ant to even realize that when it's time to let go, you have to just let go. Don't hold on to... We hold on to a lot, you know. Um, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, because we are taught to hold on, right? Um, and let, letting go is somehow um, scary for people, so, or, or it's it's counterintuitive in today's world. But it's actually one of the most powerful lessons Swami teaches us that the magic in letting go and letting God take over. In other words, you are let a, by letting go, you actually allow a higher wisdom to take over. And therefore, it actually is a greater source of empowerment rather than a meekness and things like that. So Jesus had to die for Christ to be born. So the ego has to die for another spirit has to be born. In other words, that letting go has to happen. Sometimes the guru decides to teach person. It sounds, seems harsh sometimes when in life we are taught the harsh lessons of letting go, whether it is... Um, uh, material possessions, whether it is personal relationship, whether it's um, um, uh, money that we hold on to, or house, or objects, um, or experiences, he, he, he kind of slowly weans away. And I think the, the truly dear and near ones to him, he takes them through this path. It's not easy. I still remember when he said, when, you, when I take you in this path and he held my hair, he said, you will want to run away from me. I'm giving you a tough time because I don't know if any hair left. <laughs> but he held my hair explaining, he said, Nenu jutu patkantanu, nenu odalanu. I will not, even if you want to run away from me, I will not let you go. I will hold on to you. And he held my hair really tight, you know. <laughs> then, he, then he, of course, he set it back. Um, in, it's in that context that we really learn what is, as we go through our life, it's not that we should all become monks and we give up stuff. It is not a materially or physically giving up things. It is a mental poise that we need to develop. That it is there today, okay, let me enjoy it. It may not be there tomorrow and that's okay. It's, it's, it's kind of the phase in life. Um, it needs a lot of, it's not easy. Um, very early in our days with Swami, I, I remember this evening where he sat and he explained this and he said, it is in that context that you have to understand my te tests. Um, on the one side he says, I, I, don't, I don't need to test. What is testing? It is your imagination. At the same breath in a few minutes later, he said, but I also test. So we have to understand that. And I don't want to go too deep into that, but I want to keep the focus on this letting go concept. So he said, there are three zeros I will make you pass through. And there was Pedda Potoma that time in that interview. Now, for those of you who know, Pedda Potoma is a lady who had seen Shirdi Baba when she was young, 16 years old. Shirdi Baba had attained Samadhi and apparently told her um, that he would come again. And so she has been waiting and waiting. And then she heard there was another Sai Baba in Puttaparthi. 
Um, and so she came to see, and then immediately Swami recognized her and said, I've been waiting for you to come. Um, and then I have seen that relation between her and Swami. It was very unique, okay? I, as a young boy, I, we were all with Swami was, you know, we treated him as um, a father figure, guru figure. But she was much older than Swami. So she, when Swami is giving for darshan, coming for darshan, if two days he doesn't go near her, from, from where she's sitting, she'll look at him. <laughs> Swami will be so embarrassed. <laughs> Swami will actually get angry. What is this? She's yelling and she'll loudly uh, you know, tell, come here, what are you going here? Just going off somewhere. So all the devotees, there's those days, will clamor to sit next to her because they know Swami will come to her. Otherwise <laughs> she won't let go. Her, her devotion was just very unique. It was completely, for us, it was very foreign. Um, I, I cannot even think of that uh, or from my relation with Swami. But for her, it was like that. A very unique and very beautiful relation. So she was in that room and Swami was telling us, you don't know how much she has gone through with me. Uh, you should, you should, uh, she have tested her and she has gone through all my zeros, he said, zeros. Um, what are the zeros? So he went on to explain that. And that was one of the solemn uh, discourses of Swami where it was not a playful thing, but he very ex beautifully explained that the first zero is if you lose all your material possessions, will you still love me? Will you still keep your connection with God? Others you'll blame somebody loses something, you'll say, see, I believed you. You know, that we have at, at some level, and Atul and I were talking um, uh, even yesterday, at some level we have this mindset of a barter system, right? If, if God is not of any use to you, then you look for a God who has got some. That's why we have falashrutis at the end of every shloka. What do I get by chanting 1008 Vishnu Sahasanama? Okay, there's a big list of benefits. Oh, good, good. So at some level we do, even consciously we might say we don't want, that at some level there's always an expectation. That's why when our expectations are not met, when we cannot find anybody to blame, you turn to God and say, why did you do this to me? It's so easy for us. Why did we do that? We do that because at some level there's an expectation. And so Baba would say, the first zero is, if you lose materially everything, will you still have the courage to love God? That is only the first zero. The second zero is, if you lose your relations, your near and dear ones, will you still be on the path and love God? So the second step, see, objects can be lost. A tornado hits your home, you lose your home, whatever it is, God forbid. But then something like that happens, we can somehow, you know, go through that, I guess. But when you suddenly um, lose a near and dear one, just like that, and then you want explanations, you want you demand explanations, you because that grief, you need a closure, right? You know, how to handle that grief? We don't know. And therefore, we turn to him, we blame him, we run away from him, we, kind of all of this happens. Those are tests. Those are done because he loves you. He says, these are my near and dear ones only, I take that. Not everybody. The other ones will get the miracles and vibhuti appearing in their house, their encouragement. Come, come into my foot. It's a carrot and stick approach. You know, Krishna and the Gopika is nice, you know. But then when it really comes, push comes to shove, he says, all right, now you want God it? Come on, let's get down to business. It is not, I, I'm not saying this to scare you or anyone about Godhead, but this is to teach us what is really important in life. What is it that I'm holding on to? Really, what am I holding on to? Can I let go of the things? Um, I may be ready to let go of material positions, a sannyasi. So he came to the third zero. He said, but sannyasi does this also. Sannyasi gives up material positions. Sannyasi gives up relationship. Then he said, the third zero is the most difficult zero. I'll take away your reputation. When you are wallow in shame and guilt, can you hold on to me? Just think of that. What if a good name is destroyed? You work hard, right? Maybe it's your own mistake. He makes you do it. Just to go through that, that we hold on to that. I, I stood for this for so long and suddenly that goes. He pulls that under your rug, under your feet. Then he says, even the good name that you are clinging on to can go. That zero, if you cross, then you will get me. These are things I heard directly from the, it's not read from books. So these are the things I always hold on to. 
at that moment, it was a somber moment. We we kind of really were, wow. <laughs> Perhaps you're feeling the same thing as I felt when I was young. Then, oh my gosh, this is where Swami is going to take us. But then Swami said, I will never test you until you're ready for it. It will never happen if you're not ready. So don't worry. When the time comes, <laughs> we'll test. However, how many ever lifetimes it will take, it will come, but you have to let go. The ultimate ego is to let go. We, we say we have surrendered, I have no ego left, um, we can sing bhajans, right? We can think of that, but when it really happens, in what manner does it happen, we have no... There is a higher power that teaches us those powerful lessons. And Swami said, if you pass these three zeros, and she said she has passed all these three zeros. Um, and therefore, she's my dear, near and dear devotee. Later on, Professor Kasturi, as a follow-up of that uh, lecture, uh, uh, that talk that Swami gave a few of us, Professor Kasturi was also there. He actually shared an English poem of Swami that we had, we had a copy. Um, uh, How do you know that you love me? How do you know that I love you? There's a very beautiful poem. He apparently wrote it in English. Um, with Professor Kasturi, I think, was his AI, <laughs> so his GPT. So perhaps he and Professor Kasturi wrote this, I don't know. But very beautiful and wonderful, wonderful poem it is. If I do get a chance, I'll share that. Um, I don't have it. I used, I had it memorized it for many, many years, but I, it kind of slips my mind. It must be there in print somewhere. So the, the journey into spirituality is actually the idea of letting go. It is, it is truly the dying on the cross that Jesus experienced. Not necessarily in a negative way. We don't have to be feared. We're not going to be whipped and we're not going to suffer it out. But knowing that he is with us is the greatest of comfort. And the greatest treasure that we need to yearn for is not take me through a real path, take me to a smooth path, keep me away from challenges and losses. Let me see a rosy path. If that is the case, I guess life will become very boring, correct? Uh, it'll be like watching a 1940 black and white movie. <laughs> There'll be no action. The, the scene just goes on forever. Um, but the, the joy is, is, is knowing that he is with me. Just be with me. That's enough. When you are with me, I'm ready to withstand. Like Arjuna said, you only I want you next to me. Krishna said, I will not even raise a little finger during the war. And Arjuna, with Krishna by his side, Arjuna lost his own son, right? Um, he couldn't do anything. Then um, all the Pandavas went through a lot of loss and grief. Everything happened. Krishna just riding the chariot, taking him into the war, deeper and deeper into the war. But Arjuna trusts Krishna. Okay, you know what you're doing. Take me through this. Give me, just be with me. So Adi Shankara says this beautifully in the Bhajagovindam. And when we wrote the Bhajagovindam drama many years later, and Swami was spending hours explaining the gist of the meaning of that to us, and actually we enacting it out, uh, it was it was almost like we had a chance to contemplate on it, reenact that verse, and, and kind of really, it, it, uh, many of us felt it was, em, em, we imbibed uh, some, some of that. And so uh, Adi Shankara sings this beautifully. Can you give me C sharp? You want more volume? Mm. The secret, therefore, how do I know? How do I? How do I now get God in our lives? What do we do to do that? And Baba has explained this clearly, and every single scripture explains this clearly. There is nothing, nothing out of the world we need to do. All we need to do is call out to Him, chant His name, Nama Smarana. That Smarana, just think of Him all the time. And he is there with you all the time. Period. The moment you think of him, he is there. How does that mean? What how, What does that mean? Let, one say, let me finish this thought and we'll come back to the singing. Because the mind has no shape of its own, the mind becomes what you think. There is no mind really. Where is the mind? There is no such thing as a mind. Mind is not a, a, an actual, uh, either a physical organ. The brain is a physical organ, right? The mind is like the software. It exists where the thought exists. If there is no thought, there is no mind. Like in deep sleep, there is no mind because there is no thought. So when I think of a lion, at that moment, the mind has become the lion. Imagine, at that moment, the mind has become the lion. And if I identify myself with the mind, I am the lion at that moment. So if I think of Hanuman, at that moment, I am Hanuman. Every, what, in whatever way I imagine him. So imagine if I think of Baba, if I think of God, if I think of Krishna, Rama, the name of your choice. That's why he says, choose any name, any form. It really doesn't matter. Think because at that moment, you become that. You just become one with that. 
And what better way than calling out the name? Why is the name more powerful than the form? Why can't we just sit silently and meditate on a form? Because 99% of the time, the form is borrowed. The form is not manifested from the sound to you. How does Rama look like? We have heard descriptions in, in writings. Ajanubhakam, Aravinda Netram, all that we've heard. But what does that mean? Have we got the darshan? No, we have borrowed a painter's expression. We buy, buy a picture on Amazon or somewhere and print it and say, this is how Rama looked like. That is somebody else's imagination. Where is he manifested through you, to you? So when we call out the name, we focus on the power of the name, then that energy constantly, the mind is searching to make a form out of that name. So the beauty in these names are, they are powerful bijakshara, the sound energies, actually create that form to you. Rama has a form. That form will materialize. So that is like the Pratyaksha Darshana. That is, you will get your vision of Rama. And that will be your vision of Rama, not a borrowed vision of Rama. It is the same thing with Swami. If you have seen Swami, now you have a memory of Swami. But if you want to make him come alive, chant his name. And he will come into your garden. He will give Darshan. That Pratyaksha is, wow, I saw him. I can see him. That joy is priceless. Priceless. Nobody needs to tell you then whether Rama exists or not. You know that Rama exists in the sound and that sound can manifest itself. So it is with any other, any form. And therefore, Adi Shankara says, Bhaja Govindam. Just, just Bhaja Govindam, Govindam, Govindam. In other words, chant the name of God. That's all you have to do. Call out to Him. Keep calling out to Him. Then we learn to get, we learn to let go of this. Whatever we are holding on to, whether it is material possessions, relations, that sense of if it comes, well and good. If it's not there, well and good, because I've got now the real treasure. So in moments like these, we discuss the highest principles and therefore we share these thoughts. And so he sings is beautiful. And most of you know this. Bhaja Govindam Bhaja Govindam Govindam Bhaja Mudamate Bhaja Govindam Bhaja Govindam Govindam Bhaja Mudamate Samprapte Sannihite kaale nahi nahi rakshati Dukrin karane nahi nahi rakshati Dukrin karane nahi nahi rakshati Nahi nahi rakshati No, this, what will not save you? Dukrin karane So, Baba would, we had a boy playing it, playing the role of a Brahmin. He'll come, he'll sit, um, he'll pundit or whatever, and he'll be, you know, mechanically doing things. And Swami, as again, as a child, you will laugh so much watching that. Even we won't laugh. We will like, what is there so much to laugh? Because he gets so childish. He'll like, oh, look at him. <laughs> and he's, literally, tears will be rolling down his eyes. So childish he'll become when he becomes a drama. He's actually watching that. Do it again, do it again. He'll make it. Like, you know, you do something and child will say, I want you to do it again. If you stop, he'll start crying, right? So you do, the three-year-old, you have to go on entertaining him. I've done that because I have nieces and nephews. And then I get tired in five minutes. But Baba will say, do it again. That scene, certain scenes, he would love it. Right? So this is that Dukrin Karne. And Swami made some beautiful statements, and I'm paraphrasing his words. Um, so he said, Dukrin Karne is not, is not just um, um, rituals and mindless rituals and pujas. When anything becomes mindless, it is, it is a, uh, an act which is, doesn't get you anything. So he says, your daily activities you do mindlessly. The same, you get up, you brush your teeth, you go to the bathroom, adanta dukrin karne kada. Adanta, everything is the same. It is the same mindless routines we do, right? We eat, we say we have a variety to eat. What is it? It's the same masala, but it just disguises itself in different um, vegetables and comes back to you. We think we're eating varieties, but it's the same thing. The same sleeping, the same side of the bed we like to sleep on. We have our favorite sofas at our home, right? Uh, if you look at if you look at our lives, analyze it. For the most part, it is just repeating itself, almost mindlessly. 
except when we take a break off and we sit like this and say let's think about something deeper otherwise it just goes on you know we are big be, we become so predictable why are we predictable as we age because dukrin karne we've done it again and again so many times that mindlessly we do that's why it's a good idea to have a pet we had two dogs they will know whether you're getting up to get them something or you're getting up to go eat your food or you're getting up to go to work they know you're just getting up from the chair but the actions are so subtly different for each they know exactly so if it is going for work they won't follow you they'll say i he's going he'll come back in the evening they'll just sit and watch you going but if you're getting up to get them a biscuit they'll know exactly okay he's getting something for me they'll follow you with a wag tails wagging how do they see that because they see things which you have taken for granted you and i because we become so mechanical in that repetition and and that becomes mindless and when that becomes mindless we live a robotic life same and and think of it think of our lives in in general in a philosophy right we all grow up we borrow ideas oh we need to get a degree if we get a degree oh we need to get a job we get a job we need to get promotions we get a promotion we need to buy a home we buy a home now we get married now we get married oh we have to have children it never ends why we are doing this everybody is doing it i have to do it and that's one kind of a cycle we borrow from each other we pass it down to our children and everybody lives that borrowed life it becomes dukrin karne so that baba says nahi nahi rakshati dukrin karne so what is the answer bhaj govindam bhaj govindam govindam bhaj mudamate muda jahi Muda, right? You see, in Sanskrit, we think they are soft and beautiful, but it's actually very powerful words. Oh, foolish one, you know. Oh, foolish. Muda, muda means foolish one. Uh, maybe a very nice way of saying idiot, you know. Uh, muda is is actually a powerful word. Muda jahi jana gama trishna. Your your craving for things which are just going to come and go. What what are you chasing them for? what what only matters is the effect of your actions make your actions good be content with what you do the good karmas and know that the fruits of those those will automatically manifest don't go on chasing this so he sings this and then he says bhaj govindam so let's translate that into a bhajan as well mood jahi hi danagam trishna narama govinda गोकुलनंदन गोपाला भज गोविंदम भज गोविंदम गोविंदम भज मुडमते गोविंदम भज मुडमते इट वाज स्पोर्ट्स मीट एंड around january 11 shankranti time a uh, good weather condition so baba allowed us to kind of it slowly as as a, as the years went by uh, in the new college that was started in puttaparthi a kind of a sports season came about and that was after baba's birthday uh, we would get down to practicing playing games uh, and then baba would come to watch it and slowly that kind of manifested itself into a sports meet a sports event then he would come to give prizes and he chose to do it on the shankranti day he would come and give a discourse and actually give prizes so january 11th to 14th is now a very well established sports events time so there was a time when he would come and watch us practice many games um and then he would call us in the evening and and he would also share his own um views on games and things like that again uh, um, there was there was very rarely any time a conversation which apparently didn't have a lesson behind it so this is one more thing i always remember so one evening somebody was talking to us about table tennis and he said oh i also you play table tennis well you play because he came and watched us and new table was there um we played a little ping pong and so somebody said even i used to play in raja venkatagiri's time um and i think in 40s and 50s when somi was in his 20s i guess so he used to go to the palace and they had a ping pong table so he would lift his dhoti with one hand and play so 
um, their son, grandson was studying with us and so they related this as Swami would do that earlier days. And now, of course, there are pictures of him playing table tennis. One or two, one or two pictures are there as well. On the internet, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, so, Swami said, oh, I also used to play table tennis. I also know very well. You know, again, going back to, oh, you think you guys are playing, I know very well, you know, that kind of a thing. But then he, would, he made some very good points. So as, as he was explaining the game, he said, you know, how it, you should play. If you hit it too high, the, the ball will go outside the table. If you hit it too low, the ball will go into the net. You have to be very careful. Um, and we were like, uh, of course, yeah, we know that. <laughs> of course, we didn't say that. But this is how childish he was while explaining. Again, but he said, you know the secret? Again, see, here's where he'll slip the beautiful teaching. He said, you know what is the secret? The secret is the angle in your hand. You don't have to worry there. Don't look at the net. Don't look at the table. Just think a slight change in the angle here. You could have a little bit of 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 a little and he did that every 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 moment of his life the beauty of swami was and i always say this in the context of vedanta when you when you watch um, beings like these when you live with them you begin to observe their daily lives what is it that impresses you most is how they are tuned in all the time into that who they are correct how do they portray that it is that small little things. He would pay attention to the very small things of life. Um, his, his, the, the way his towel would be in his bathroom, the way his, he would put his toothbrush back in its place, right from there, the way he would do his bed, the way how particular he was in the cleanliness of his room, the cleanliness of his dress, you know. He paid attention to that. So the Vedantin truth is Anuraniyan Mahato Mahiyan. It says, in the tiniest of the tiny, God exists. And in the largest of the largest, God exists. So the tiniest acts of ours, if does God exist in those tiny acts, if we can ask ourselves, then the big acts can, then the big darshans and the liberation will take care of itself. But it's in the tiny acts, if we miss, we, we kind of, you know, we have to clean the house or we kind of have to do our bed or something. And you say, oh, gosh, I have to just do it. And you're doing it for sake of doing it. And there's a grunting and moaning or whatever the resistance is. That, if that, those acts are not done with the same equipoise, okay, it has to be done, I'll do it. It has to be done and there's no resistance. Then the big things in life also, will, there will be no resistance in life. The little resistances that we pay, that we encourage in small acts, all of that manifest as big resistances in life, you know, in form of illnesses or all of those things. With Swami, I saw how people ask, how did he, how do you think he managed these mega projects and all of that? How did he attract the big uh, donors? How did he get all the free hospitals and all of that done? And the only way I can answer them is he paid attention to the small acts of giving, the small acts of kindness. And by that, the best way to exam tell you my own examples because I, those are the ones I rely on and that's the only way I can tell you they are 100% true. So there was this uh, drama rehearsal. He comes, he watches the rehearsal. Two days later is the drama actually going to happen. It's Swami's birthday. You know, thousands of people come on his birthday. He has so many things on his mind because they're all coming to see him, right? Um, so... When he came, he saw the drama, he saw the rehearsal, and I was hoping for some last minute instructions if Swami had. So I went right up to the car door where he would get in and waited there because all the other boys were there. And so Swami may not have seen me. So I said, in case he wants to give me some instructions because I was more or less kind of in charge of these dramas and plays. And so um, as he gets in, if there was something, he would say, you know, be careful, the audio is not good or work on that, something like that, you know, so we can do some homework. So I was waiting near the door and Swami came as he was about to, I was keeping my hands like this. He noticed a little, my shirt was torn. Some, somewhere I must, have, I must have caught on to something. A little tiny, tiny little tear. Tiny, really I'm telling you, so tiny that we wouldn't care. And Swami's eyes went on to that. He said, hey, and he poked his finger into it. Chi, 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 
you know he was a perfectionist always he's, that mindfulness in his in his presence is literally mindfulness i mean you and i will think oh nobody will see it <laughs> he doesn't think it that way and i can tell you so many examples of that so he poked his finger and he said chi 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 what is this uh, then that's when i noticed a tear in the shirt i looked at him i just said swami smile and he just did face like this to no pata something and he got into the car so the i was happy that he didn't have any uh, big task to give for the drama because our mind is only on the big things the little things we don't care but his mind was pay attention to everything at every time that's the beauty that's a proof of divinity truly um the the small acts how do they re- respond to the small acts you know and nevertheless so anyway he goes off i forgotten about it this would have been a just a, a story half finished story like this but the story has a beautiful lesson here 22nd morning 23rd is his birthday 22nd morning there's a prime minister sitting on the veranda and everything swami opens the door with a brown paper bag you know like the grocery bags we have he comes out and he steps into the bhajan hall and he says where is ayer and i get up because i was at the back we were practicing late into the night i got came a little late i just nailed he called me like this and then he flung the paper bag towards me he said that there is shirt cloth in it go st- get yourself a st- stitch stitch yourself a good shirt then I, then i remembered oh my god this is about yesterday's shirt i couldn't what is he coming and asking me for he gave, go get a good st- stitch he smiled and he went away i opened it and saw a piece of white you know cloth um and i did get a shirt stitched but the point here is why would he take that why would that matter to him so much was i a shirtless you know beggar on the street and i could have said daya maya and all of that right nothing it wasn't like that were, were we big donors nothing we were just regular people right how and why did he pay attention to that small thing but that's who he was a small little thing disturbed him he would attend to that right away even if he had given a shirt piece to me a week later i would still be telling you the story with the greatest enthusiasm but look at the added luster to the story is on the eve of his birthday when he has so many other things to take care of he this thing bothered him and knowing what he would have done in his room having stayed in his room i knew that he would because he was alone he would open the cupboard he would have picked it put it in a cup and lap and he would have brought it this i had to give it to sundara because his shirt was torn poor fellow i'll give him you know what makes a person do that would i do that i certainly wouldn't do it right because i have so many other things to take care of this boy anyway i'll take care of him later i'll put it in my <laughs> smartphone calendar reminder two days later give sundar a shirt piece but see that is the divinity do we do that if we want to become divine if we want to be divine if we want to reflect divinity in our lives uh we have to do the least dramatic of things 10 people getting together 1000 people getting together chanting rudram 11 times 100 times we oh so many people came vibrations are awesome ah, oh we do all that but what is it that we do when we are alone what are the little things that we do we do we go back to being the same old person with and uh, not paying attention to the little things do we still help a person at, they need help at that moment are we there irrespective of whatever happens are we there if we need to ask ourselves what is that quality of a life when i am alone and even ramakrishna paramahamsa if you know his teachings he would say the most virtuous man is the one who practices virtue when he is alone not in front of people it's easy for me to talk like this sit with you in state and they'll say aha sundara i sat straight for 3 hours i'll be nice and happy what do i do when i am alone only i know that and only god knows that and that uh, little acts will automatically reflect in my thoughts word and deeds as life unfolds itself always the case so in order if we want to fix the world we just have to go back to our home and fix our little acts and if all of us fix our little acts the world will be a golden place to live it still is i'm just saying that it will be a much much better place to live don't you agree swami paid attention to those little little things um there was a, a a role of a teacher that i played in a drama his drama he wrote the drama chepinatlu chestara and he had acted it out when he was very young so when it came to us there was this boy v shrikant who was a young uh, singer of bhajan and swami somehow related to him as his childhood days so swami said you will be the satya we'll do a drama i'll redo my drama with you playing my role 
so that boy had a, he's in Boston now, uh, a great singer and bhajan singer and all that. But he was a young boy that time. So, and I was a villain, the schoolmaster <laughs> who punishes Satya. You know, you know the story, the schoolmaster punishes Satya and he gets stuck on the chair. Uh, and somehow I always get these kind of roles. Uh, so see, I wanted to be a comedian, so I didn't get a chance to be a comedian. In most of these dramas, I got roles like that. Uh, Mother-in-law of Radha in Radha Krishna drama, or <laughs> school teacher punishing Satya. Anyway, the point here was, coming back to the little things, Swami came a few, uh, maybe about 30 minutes before the drama began. Again, it's on, it's on the eve of his birthday. He comes to the backstage, and he kind of goes through the, everybody is dressed up and ready for the scheme. This, the curtain is not open, the drama is not begun, but he comes inside, he wants to see everybody in the green room, right? So he comes and sees everybody. He looks at me. So I have a long kurta, which is coming right up to my knees, and I wore a dhoti. Now, I was not an expert wearing a dhoti. I never wore a dhoti before, but um, somebody taught me how to wear a dhoti, and then I decided I'll do that. I tucked it in some, in some manner, made it look good. And because the, the kurta comes right up to your knees, what is left is barely seen. So I said, chalega, ye chalega apne liye. You see the little lax, we don't care. We just want to hide it, right? Say, so it's okay. Let it, uh, nobody will see it. It's just a drama. And most of the time, I'm going to be stuck on the chair anyway. <laughs> so I won't even, I'm not even going to get up in my role. Because that's what happens to the school teacher. So Swami comes, he looks at me. He says, yen di do ti, itle ves kuntara. And he's joking, he said, you're a South Indian, you, are you an Ayer kada nuo? You're a Brahmin? You don't know how to wear a do ti? Thu dunno pata ikadra, he said. You know, I was very embarrassed. How did he figure it out? Because it looked pretty authentic from below the <laughs> kurta. So he made me lift the kurta. He pulled the do ti out and he put the pleats. Not, he didn't ask somebody, hey, help him tie a do ti and all. He could have done that, right? He tied the place, he made it, he bent down and he, you know, ironed it properly. He, so, so I'm standing like this, completely embarrassed and shocked that Swami is doing it with my, with the kurta in my hand. And he's bending down almost right up to my feet. He is going down, adjusting the dhoti, pressing it and says, Chudu, it'll undal a bag. And he tucked it into my <coughs> pesko. I put bag on Now put the kurta. I looked down. For me, it looked exactly the same. But in his mind, okay, this is how you're supposed to wear <laughs> This is how you're supposed to wear. Good, Manchidi Prapo. He was very happy. That Anuranian. For me, I can never figure those, and there are many stories like this, but the, the, what, what is it that God looks into it? A person who's into that consciousness, what is he looking? He's looking for authenticity there. That authenticity of a teacher wearing a dhoti. That's all, that, that, the, the role. And that authenticity has to be 100% authenticity. 98% doesn't cut, <laughs> cut the deal there. 90% won't. It has to be 100%. You can't just make believe, make it look like you're a, you know, it has to be like that. Perfect. So that little, little things, uh, while it was really not important in a drama point of view, but for, for him, it was very important. And because he paid attention to the little small things, I think all the big things automatically aligned themselves for him. He would say the universe will align everything if your thought word and deed is same. And if his thought word and deed was authentic, he always wanted to see authenticity in every single act. There was a boy who played, played the role of Radha. He, was, he had a deep voice. And because we were boys and he's playing a role of Radha who was a girl, when it came to singing, he tried to sing in a false voice. And Swami was so annoyed. <laughs> Now, as young boys, we said, okay, you are good because you sing in a false voice. Otherwise, it look odd. You're going to be dressed up as a girl and deep voice come out of girl. It doesn't look nice for you and me, right? Isn't that natural? So when this boy sang in a false voice, Swami asked him, you have a cold today? What happened? <laughs> so when he came to the rehearsal, he said, what happened? You have a cold today? You sing so well. What happened today? He said, no, Swami, no cold. Then why is your voice sounding strange? <laughs> He said, Swami, no, Radha, that's why I wanted to. No one was He got so angry. He said, keep quiet. What nonsense are you talking about? Sing in your original voice. And so, um, on the final day, there is Radha coming out and singing with a deep male voice. She's singing. It seemed very embarrassing for us, but for Swami, he's very happy. Because in that, he wanted that feeling to emerge. And he said, you can't have a false voice and have real bhava. The feeling mattered to him. 
you are Radha and he trained him for, we would sit for 45 minutes in an interview room and Swami will be training him to sing. Same line, he would repeat, he was an accomplished singer, learned South Indian music, but he will repeat the same sentence, Swami will make him repeat again and again and again. For us, listening to both of them, one singing and one repeating, we will think it's the same, but Swami will say, no, 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 itla kaadu, itla, aha, aha, he will say, aha, aha, no, itla kaadu, aha, aha, aha. So, he's, he, what is Swami listening to? What is he listening to? Because for me, those are like the greatest moments of He's showing us his, a, a divinity of a different kind. He was listening to something else. The, the tone of that voice, the bhava behind it. And He grilled this boy in and out till he got that. And so when he sang finally, he probably had that. I, I, there's no way I can be a judge to that. But he probably had that bhava, that feeling that Radha would have had and which Swami related to while in, from a dramatic point of view, we were thinking, oh my gosh, Maya was in the primary school, say we were all giggling because of a boy <laughs> dressed up as a girl coming and singing in a male voice. I asked her, what did you all think? He said, we were all laughing. It doesn't matter to him. You see, this is what, when you are truly convinced about something, it doesn't matter what the world thinks of you. We often compromise trying to please the world because we would say, what will others think if my boys do like this? Okay, you sing in a girl's voice. It would have been easy for Swami to do that, right? Because after all, Radha Krishna, it's about values and all of that, something else. Swami would have justified that. that you and I would have justified that. At least I, I would have justified, say, let's do a drama which makes sense to everybody. But here he was, he was stuck to his authenticity no matter what. It didn't matter whether people saw it or not. He want, he saw something that he didn't that others didn't see, and it is it is that perspective that made him stand out from the rest. If we have that conviction, and if that conviction reflects itself truly, then we don't care about what others think. Most of our fears sometimes are what others will think. Oh my gosh, why am I going through this? What will others think of me? What are others talking about me? Who cares? I am clean. My, I am relational with Swami is clean. And I, this is what I believe in. This is what I want to do. This is how I like my altar. This is how I want it. It doesn't matter who else thinks of it. It's me and my God. This is my connection. I don't have to chant Rudram because everybody in my, all my friend circle are chanting Rudram. Do you connect to it? If you connect to it, by all means, go learn and enjoy the learning processes and chant because you become one with that chant and you love it for whatever reason, go ahead. But if you're not connecting to it, then don't do it because everybody else is doing it. And don't do it out of fear. What if I don't do it? Something might go wrong. So let me do it. So all these are uh, where we lose connections with the divine. If we truly connect and be authentic to ourselves, then I think divinity manifests itself. And, and Swami was a direct reflection of that. His, his, these are the little acts that he showed that he had a, a very different view of uh, reality. And similarly, in, in Bhajagovindam, there was a, uh, I played a pundit, again a haughty pundit, <laughs> who was, whose ego is uh, subdued. See, I always get the villain comedic role. Uh, and so I, and then Adi Shankara comes and he, teaches me a lesson. So in that, I am dressed up as a leader of the pundits. So Swami, um, the first time he saw, he liked it. The second time, he gave us all a shawl. And the third time, um, well, second time, be, be, because he took us many times across the country. He took us to Bangalore, he took us to Bombay, the whole group. Come on, let's do this drama. Everybody likes it. Bhaju Govindam drama. So, so he called me and he said, you're the chief pundit, whereas you need a bangle. You know, it's, it's called a kankanam. Okay. Um, gold bangle. So he went inside, he got a bangle. Now, as pundits in Swami's drama, um, Swami is very traditional, right? So there's no bare bodied pundits in his drama, or they always wear kurta, right? So we are all wearing full sleeves kurta and dhoti. By then, of course, I knew how to tie a dhoti. So that was <laughs> done. This is another drama, another lesson to come. So the kurta was a full sleeve. And he, for him, that pundit need to, needed to have your, your, because I'm supposed to be the Kashi Vishwanath pundit. So fully, uh, you know, a, accomplished pundit. I'm singing in some slokas and all in that. So he's seeing in his eyes, he's seeing an accomplished pundit, right? For him, that picture has to match. This is the way I'm interpreting it. So he calls me, he said, Anta peta panditu ni, you kankanam leda niku, and undu. And he said, he went and bought, he took out a box and he had kept these, he keeps it to actually give to real pundits. <laughs> 
So he took my hand, put it on his stomach, and he tied it around, and it has got a small hook. He puts it on top, and it was loose because it's thick and big here. And then he pushes it all the way to this, to my forearm where it stays. It's like a half inch thick gold color. And so he pushes it all the way in. Ah, he could undal a manchidi. Then he took the kurta, put it back. Said, Ah, he put bagundi. What is bagundi? For the drama, it is deep inside. Neither I can see it, nor anybody has any idea that. But at that moment, he it had to be there. Now these are the stories you may not come across, but doesn't it make you think? What is Swami trying to tell us there? You and I will not do it if we want to dress up children. You dress up little children for the for the Krishna drama or anything. They dress up as Rama. So many things that nobody will see it. Don't worry, it's okay. Kids only, it's okay. It puts them. But but when we let go, what are we letting go? Are we letting go our definition? Chalega because we are not clear. What is my definition of Krishna? It's not there. Then therefore, it is okay for. Somebody else to dress up something like Krishna, and if the dhoti doesn't fit in, we'll say it's okay because we don't know what Krishna looked like. But for him, that Krishna had to look like something. A pundit had to look like something, and that authenticity had to be reflected in that role, whether it is seen on the drama stage, it is actually visible or not. It had to be there, and he presented that because he was happy. Ah, he put bagundi, he said. But I was very thrilled because that's a wonderful, wonderful gift he gave me. Um, you know, and he said, as he was tying, he was muttering, "I'm kankana kartuna ra, and you go kankana kartuna ra." Means, I, I understand it. I, he said, "I'm bonding myself with you with this boy. It's a bond I'm tying with you." You know, so. You have to put these things in a book. <laughs> yes, with Swami's grace, I, I will. But I, I, I get very, um, very excited sharing the story. So if I'm a little dramatic, forgive me. But, but these are such beautiful stories. It inspires me whenever I get tempted to say nobody is going to see this. Push it under the rug. No, wait. I saw it, right? I had to respect me. Why do I not respect myself? Somebody else is not able. None of you will notice, but I saw it, and therefore let me fix it. For Swami, it was like that. He saw this pundit doesn't have a kankan. He's supposed to be the head of Kashi. So let me give him, let him wear it inside. So for him, in his imagination, everything is pakka. Inside, he's wearing kankan. I know it. You know that kind of a thing. Similarly, in 65th birthday, there was a drama. He said, I, um, I, "I'm a Hari Katha pundit. Again, another pundit role. I, I seem to kind of get a niche with Swami, uh, doing this pundit role. So in Hari Katha, I am singing and and speaking something in the drama." And so, as a Harikatha pundit, you know, in India they have the um, uh, Chitakalu, and I'll share that story with you before I display this. I was just putting my hands and doing this because drama, you know, it's a big stage, Shanti Vedika, thousands of people, and throughout the rehearsal, Swami also saw me. I was doing like this and singing song, like this, like a pundit. I was acting and singing. The day before the drama, again on 22nd, he calls me. He said, "Anni ready gone da, Anni so I'm ready gone da. Chitiklu unda ni dagara, chitiklu ante means that thing, this chitiklu unda." I said, "Chitiklu ante le, Swami na ko. I don't have it." So dunno pata. He am just aye bolo. Swami chee to itla chee to. He am chee to itla chee to. Dunno pata. So he said, "Do you have this thing?" I said, "No." He said, "What are you going to do?" I said, "With my hands, I'll just do like this, like all, all these days I did." He said, "Do not bother. No, how can you do that?" He said, "Wait." Again, this is like on the eve of his sixty-fifth um, birthday. He goes upstairs. He comes back. He brings this. He says, "Idi jagat apatko, idi naadi. This is mine. This belongs to me. I've kept it for many years. I'm giving it to you. Keep it carefully." So this was personally used by Swami. He gave this. My gosh! When I received it, <laughs> why would he do that? Not because he. he this mattered to him, right? At that moment, and he said also, "I've kept it carefully. You keep it carefully. Keep it. Be careful." And so he gives it, and so I received it. Great treasure. I still tre treasure it. <clears throat> small little things, small little things matter to him. So when we look at lives and we say, "Oh, 
this chanting of God's name and all, we'll do it later. Now I'm so caught, caught up with my career and we say, children, I don't want my child to get into all this bhajan and all now. Let them focus on career. Later on, they can do all this. As, as good parents, we, we perhaps think I'm not a parent, so I can't say you should do this or not. But we tend to do that. For our, in our own lives, we say, now I'm focused on career or education. When it comes to spirituality, are you know, like we tell in India, we'll see it later on. When we are retired, that time we'll see. But Allah, what happens is, by the time we retire, we are so caught up in worldly things, we don't know how to get out of it. People tell me when I talk to them about health, food and all that, hey, young children, let them eat sundar. Don't go and give them discourses about staying away from sugar. Let them all enjoy life. We all enjoy life. When they grow up, they can give up sugar. I said, when they grow up, they'll be so addicted. It'll be your case. You are, have you given up sugar? No. <laughs> they'll not be able to give up sugar. The point is, when we postpone spirituality to a later date, that later date will never become the present. It will always be a later date. And therefore, spirituality remains a fantasy. Liberation becomes a fantasy. So what happens is, in order to justify, we create a God who will somehow give us liberation. That God is never there in the first place. We created him because he becomes an excuse for us. You take pity on me. You do this to me. I cannot do anything now. And because of my lack of discipline now becomes bhakti. Are I am addicted. I am weak. I am. So Adi Shankara says beautifully, this, this fantastic paragraph. He says, when are you going to chant Bhajagovindam? When your body is burning with fever and you are tattered and old, uh, is that the time? That time your senses are weak, your mind is weak, you will not, not even have the strength to chant God's name. So why not do it now? So there's no age to start it. The best is to start right now. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old. The moment you see sense in doing it, the moment you see value in doing it, let's start contemplating on higher things. In other words, remembering God's name because the mind becomes that at that moment, right? So he sings this. <coughs> भज गोविंदम भज गोविंदम गोविंदम भज मुडमते यावत् वित्तो पार्जन शक्तः स्तावन निज परिवारो रक्तः यावत् वित्तो पार्जन शक्तः तावल निजम परिवारो रक्तह पश्या जीवति जर जर देह वार्तां को पिन प्रेश्च दिगे वार्तां को पिन प्रेश्च दिगे नंदीश्वरा के नट राजा Nandishwarahe Nataraja Nandatmaja Harinarayana Bhajagovindam Bhajagovindam Govindam Bhaja Mudamate I like the mood at the end of it. Bajagovindam, Bajagovindam. Oh, foolish one, please start saying God's name. So the power of Namasmarana that, that is prescribed for this day and age uh, is not just about devoted to a God. Uh, it, it's not really religious as much as it's a powerful spiritual energy that we are releasing when we are constantly chanting, constantly chanting. Um, in my very first interview with Swami, I said, Swami, what sadhana should I do? Swami said, chant the name of God. And he said, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Chapturne Undu, he said. And he chanted the whole mantra, Maha Mantra. Uh, I was glad to listen to it from Swami's own mouth, within <laughs> like one foot away from me. And then foolishly I said, Swami, ye pudu chant chela, ye pudu chapala. You know, when do I say this? <laughs> and then Swami, as it is, he's one foot away from me. He came so close. Ye pudu ke na chapu. <laughs> he was so uh, annoyed that, how could you ask such a silly question? Ye pudu ke na chapu. Ye emti di. Bathroom lakani, kitchen lakani, poddu lakani, sayangal lakani, ye pudu ena. What does that mean? So I'll tell you, of course. I just, I, it's so, you know, I'll relive these moments. I had to tell exactly how he said it. So whether it's in your bathroom or you're in a kitchen, whether it's morning or evening, it doesn't matter when. 
just start saying it. Don't worry about, should I have a shower and say it? Should I do it in Brahma Murta? Is it more powerful? See, we try to make a technique out of everything. We miss the magic of being in the moment and just falling in love. Just chant anytime. It doesn't matter. Uh, when Swami actually materialized the lingam and gave my mother, my mother said, what kind of puja I will do? My father, they both asked, what kind of puja should we do? Swami said, you drink tea? Yes, Swami. Coffee? My father drank coffee, my mother drank tea. They both nodded. Swami said, pour it on that lingam and drink the tea. <laughs> I only want bhava. I only want bhava means I want you to feel that connection. That feeling is so, so vital. Without feeling, it becomes a mindless ritual that we uh, do reincarnate. becomes that, right? Uh, and so there is, there is no right and wrong way. It is wrong if it is not your way. If it is your connection with God, that is the right way. It has to be the right way. J. Krishnamurti says every one's path is the right path. You have to carve your path. And you have to have this courage to believe in your path. This is the only way I can connect. So let me connect to that. My father was heavily into rituals. And growing up, I had a phobia for rituals because I saw too much of that. And even when I came to Swami, I, it took me a long while, a long time to understand the essence of those. When I, when the Vedic uh, yagna started, and I, I talked to the scholars, learned more, much more learning came that way, right? And Swami himself then taught us the symbolism behind all of that, and that maturity came in a much later date. But in the early days, even when my father was there, I asked to ask him, "You have Swami here, and you can meditate." And because I was into yoga and meditation, I thought that's the better way than what is this ritual. You know, so I said, why are you doing this rituals? I mean, he said very beautifully, that's my only way. I don't know any other way. Right? And the beauty there is, he would come and Swami would give us an interview. He will, Swami will call him. He will come. He'll sit at Swami's feet. So Swami, I'll be sitting in the middle. My father one side, my mother one side. And I'll be sitting at, and they both will be here. And all my father, before the interview, he'll say, I had asked this to Swami, I had asked that to Swami. He's not talking, so many months has passed by. And he'll have a big list of what all to tell about somebody in the family here or there, something, you know. Um, he will go there, he'll sit in front of Swami. And that's all. His tears, he won't even speak. He'll completely would have forgotten. Every, Swami will say, Yemen Kawala, Chapu, Dandapani, what do you want? <laughs> that's all. So, at that moment, I felt a little embarrassed. Dad, say something. <laughs> you know, Swami will say, what is this cry baby? In fact, Swami turned around and said, Chudra, ide bhakti. This is bhakti. This is real devotion. So, we want to ask Swami. We have a list to ask Swami. But in that presence, you forgot. The joy overtakes. And so, who you are, what you wanted, everything is forgotten. There, he's just in bliss. So, how did he make that connection? It was his regular puja because he saw sense in that puja. And because he continued no matter what, he did. He would get up at 4 in the morning and do his puja. He will chant. He will say some mantras. I know, I don't know. His pronunciation may not be correct. Sometimes we'll make fun of him also in some of his pronunciation. He doesn't care. Because at that moment, uh, it was his connection to the divine. But that manifested here as pure devotion. Right? That is what I'm talking about. When you have that direct personal connection, it doesn't matter what anybody, what others do. It is more important, what do I do? And do I feel it? Do I feel that connection? It's so important. We have that one-on-one -on -one connection. And the one lesson I can take home from Swami is, your direct connection is what really matters with God, not, not somebody else's connection. And my connection cannot be somebody else. I, a husband cannot tell a wife, do this. Or the wife cannot tell a husband, you have to also do this. I'm doing this. So and so. No, it is your path. The husband might say, I, I just want to serve. I, I just like serving. I, don't, I can't sit and meditate. I'll fall asleep. It doesn't make sense to me. That, that's perfectly okay. One person's meditation doesn't have to become another person's meditation. Or somebody is interested in Rudram chanting or any chanting. It doesn't mean everybody has to do that. You have to make your connection with the divine. And I think it is so vital because when that connection is made and God comes alive in your life, then it's magical. It's like Arjuna. The, the problems in life doesn't stop, but you know he's your charioteer. And that is the greatest comfort. Knowing he's a charity, he's taking me to the most difficult tasks, but he's there for me. And that is a test of my trusting 
his uh, role of a charity. I trust you. I know you're doing this. And we trust that process. We always emerge victorious. We always look back. And there is something to be grateful about completely, always. So um, these are um, among the many, many lessons, um, small and big. This is how Tommy, Swami taught us. This is how Swami uh, helped us weave and carve our own path. And, and with every one of us, he had a direct connection. Uh, a boy next to me, if I would be sitting straight like I'm sitting now, uh, and Swami will be sitting. So even if I do this, because I've been sitting for three hours, if I do this, Swami will look at me like this. Okay? The boy next to me, he'll be like this, he will do this, he will do like this, Swami. And Swami says, are you Papa? Are you okay? <laughs> so as a young boy, I'll be thinking, wait a minute, if I just move also, why is Swami frowning at me? And this is easy, he's, you know, he's like the form boy, is like, you know, spoiled brat, or what is it? But... With him, it was a different relation. With me, if I was into yoga, Swami said, yoga is not then you, you, If that is your connection with me, then I'll, I'll treat you that way. Don't ask me the highest thing and then start squirreling around. So he, he would always, uh, and he would like the fact that I'm you know, sitting straight. He would mention it at, at sometimes. But what I'm saying is even among boys, it was always one one on one. So when we hear the story that you know in the, in the Bhagavata, it said that uh, every Gopika had her own Krishna. So as a young boy, I was thinking, how is it possible? Like, did he multiply himself? But that was a fact. Though Krishna was one, each one, each one saw him as their connection. So this boy had a different connection sitting next to me, and I had a different connection with Swami. And somebody else had a completely different connection. And so there was another lady who had a completely different So every one of us had a different Sai with them. And we come out of the interview room, we all carry different messages. The, the different, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the importance of these messages, each one carried our own. And so when we would, many times we would actually gather later on and kind of discuss what Swami said. Or we would go to uh, the rooms and share with our juniors um, what Swami would have told us in the interview room. Because Swami could not get everybody. So we being seniors, Swami would call us, tell us something and spend time with us. We go back to the dorms, boys would say, what did Swami tell you all? Can you tell us? And so if there were 10 of us gone to 10 different rooms, there would be 10 different stories. <laughs> Wait a minute, but this brother said this, but you are saying this. Both, we're all there, but we hear different things. And we, uh, the emphasis of his messages were different because what we needed to hear, we hear it, right? And we take home what we need um, from a particular discourse of Swami, always. And that's why every time we revisit these stories, every time I tell you these stories, I get something new out of it. Every time you listen to a story of Swami, even if you listen to it a hundred times, you listen to Ramayana a hundred times, uh, or, or Shirdi Sai Chatta, you read it again, every time there is something new you take home. Because your situation in life is changing, and that is only reflecting where you are. And, and so he would say, I'm only a reflection, reaction, and a resound. And therefore, we constantly listen to the same bhajan a hundred times, but we enjoy it every time we listen to it. The bhajan never becomes stale for us, right? I don't think somebody says, oh, this is an old bhajan, I'm not interested in it anymore. It, it adds value when you listen to it after a long time or you repeat it. And the beauty of Namasmarana is the more you chant it, the more you chant it, the more energizing it becomes, the more powerful it becomes, whether it's Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Narayana, or Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. The, the beauty is in that chant. And therefore, let us um, sing this bhajan and offer um, this uh, salutations to this beautiful Guru. In Bhaja Govindam words, and he says, Guru Charanam Bhuja Nirbhara Bhakta. This, this lotus feet of the Guru, we offer our devotion and, and the body that is trained in discipline, Niyama Deham. Sendriya Manasaniya, the mind and senses and the Deyam controlled in discipline, we offer that to the Divine Guru. And He gives us the highest state. Dakshasi Nija Hridayam Stam Devam. He comes and establishes Himself. Sthapana uh, Stam Devam. He becomes a deity of our heart. When we keep the body and the mind and the senses as, um, as temples, then he begins, he begins to manifest. It's a very beautiful composition. So let us, um, with our hearts, offer this to Swami and then we will combine it with the bhajan and uh, take home the lesson that no matter what, um, what the path is, what 
what your thought process is, no matter what stage we are in life, I think one beautiful, most powerful way is just remembering God. Remembering Him for the joy of it, not with a laundry list attached. Swami, please help me. Swami, please get Just Swami, full stop. Or Krishna, full stop. There is nothing after that. There is no I there, there is no my there. Let Krishna take over our consciousness. Let Rama take over the consciousness. Let at that moment just become one with that and just become be the be in joy of that divine presence as I learned from my father, who just sit there and shed tears of joy. Guru Charanam Bhuja Nirbhara Bhaktaha Samsara Tachirat Bhava Mukta Sendriya Manasang Niyama Deham Sendriya Manasang Niyama Deham Drakshasi Nija Hridayastam Devam Drakshasi Nija Hridayastam Devam Jaya Panduranga Prabho Vithala Jagado Dharam